Hello everyone and welcome to Straight Talk Live. Before we get into the full uh, discussion that we have ahead for you on this webinar, um, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Rick Davis who has an announcement for you. Hello everybody and thank you very much for joining us uh, today. Um, I bring you greetings from Cindy McCain. Uh, she was unfortunately called away with a family emergency just moments ago. Uh, I can tell you that um, our dear friend and uh, John McCain's mother, Roberta McCain, has just passed away. Uh, Roberta was 108 years old, uh, had a twin sister, Rowena, who passed away a few years ago, uh, who she now can be reunited with. So, Art, are you hearing me? Okay, I'm getting nodding heads. Um, so anyway, uh, this is the reason for Cindy's absence. She sends you all her thoughts and uh, her appreciation for attending this event and how much you value the programs that are put on by the McCain Institute. She looks forward to the next opportunity uh, to uh, see you all via Zoom, uh, but hopefully soon in real life. But I know that all of you will want to keep your uh, thoughts and prayers with the McCain family today. Uh, during uh, this, uh, this sad uh, event and uh, know that um, uh, the McCain family appreciates all the support that you've given it so for so long. Roberta was a mainstay on all of John's campaigns, whether they were for re-election to the Senate or for president. And I know many of us uh, spent a lot of time with Roberta uh, as she trundled through the campaign activities and we'll miss her dearly. So uh, I appreciate your forbearance with Cindy's absence and thank you very much for attending today's event. Rick, thanks very much uh, indeed. And of course, our thoughts and prayers go to the whole of the McCain family at this time. Um, let's start this webinar, though, because so many of you are tuned in, uh, keen to hear from our guests, Rick being one of them. So we'll be hearing much more from him later on. My name's Hannah Vaughan Jones. I'm an international journalist based here in London, eagerly watching what's happening across the pond at the moment there is an awful lot to chew over as i'm sure you're all aware uh, from personality to politics and policy to partisan politics like we've really never seen uh, before and all at the time of course when the supreme court nomination is also up and that has been playing out today in the states um, as I said, I'm in London, and while we don't get a say over here, I can assure you that we are all waiting with bated breath to hear and see how America decides on its next Commander-in-Chief. We have an amazing lineup of guests, of experts, uh, to speak today. Uh, everyone with all of the knowledge and the background uh, expertise who can tell us how each candidate, any candidate for president, actually gets the momentum to get over uh, that line. But before uh, the debate proper, uh, I would like to introduce Ambassador Mark Green. He is a former congressman, uh, he is a former ambassador to Tanzania as well, and he is now the executive director of the McCain Institute. So Mr. Ambassador, you have the floor. Uh, great. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, thanks, Rick. And on behalf of the McCain Institute, we express our deep sympathies to, uh, to the McCain family. Uh, so it was on this day last year when we hosted our annual dinner in London. And needless to say, a few things have changed since then, from the pandemic and its fallout to authoritarian clampdowns in places like Belarus and Hong Kong. When I led the International Republican Institute a few years ago, I reported directly to our chairman, then Senator John McCain. McCain had the habit of beginning every board meeting by saying, my friends, the world's on fire, so what are we going to do about it? In many ways, the McCain Institute's mission is to try to answer that question each and every day. And so we're finding new ways to keep our friends engaged and to convene leaders for principled debate and discussion. That's why we're thrilled that you've joined us. We're very grateful and we look forward to staying connected. We recently launched the Global Network Council to hear your unique perspective on issues ranging from human rights and democracy, great power competition, renewing key strategic alliances, and taking on scourges like human trafficking and human displacement. Now, obviously, we don't have all the answers, but what's clear is that the world has never had a greater need for character-driven leaders and character-driven leadership than it does right now. The kind of leadership that John McCain 
really showed us all throughout his life of service, the kind of leadership that we're dedicated at the McCain Institute to building and fostering. And so the Institute is grateful for the support you've given us in the past, and especially during these challenging times. We look forward to your continued support and participation. We all have a lot to do. Hannah, back to you. Mark, thanks so much, and it's so good to hear about the, the very important work that the Institute is undertaking at, at this critical time as well. Now, given a lot of the mudslinging that we're all used to uh, at these tail ends of election campaigns, you'd think that most people, uh, well, that the candidates rather, would still be vying for those swing voters and still trying to win some people over. But it turns out that most Americans, it seems at least, have already made up their mind about which way this is going to go. So it is with some trepidation that I introduce our next guest. And I say that pushing the memory of 2016 to the back of my mind when it comes to, uh, to, to pollsters and their predictions. Um, but the next gentleman should have a good idea of uh, at least where things stand right now. I'm introducing, of course, uh, Bill McIntyre to lay out the state of the election for, for, for you all. Bill is a long time John McCain pollster uh, and an NBC Wall Street Journal pollster now, uh, Bill, 22 days to go. What is the state of the race? Well, the state of the race has changed. Uh, there was the most... President, First Lady, and their youngest son with COVID-19. All of this has not gone well for Donald Trump. Two weeks ago, he was losing the national race by about seven points. Today, he's losing it by 10 and a half. He is uh, still in contact and meaning within margin of error, then some in a handful of swing states. But uh, this election is after a essentially nine months of stability, meaning Trump behind by five to seven points. Uh, we see the race a little bit weaker uh, for Trump. Uh, now, uh, because of the way we elect our president, um, I don't think there's any chance Trump wins the national popular vote. There is still some chance still that he could do what he did which in 2016, which is very difficult, which is More from you uh, later on, right. but in the time, uh, we'll get on with the main debate now. And before we do, before I introduce our, our, our two guests, um, I would encourage all of you watching as well to use the Q&A uh, button, which is at the bottom of, the, of your screen. If you have questions for, for Trevor, for Bill, or for uh, David Axelrod and Rick Davis, Rick, who you saw at the beginning of, of, of this broadcast, then please do, uh, also for Mark as well, please do send your questions in. We will try and make time and get to as many of them uh, as possible. But on to the debate, and let me uh, introduce our two guests, uh, formerly at least. Rick Davis, who you heard from just now, uh, a longtime McCain advisor, of course, of 2000 and 2008 presidential uh, campaign manager and currently sits on the, on the board of trustees for the McCain Institute. Um, and David Axelrod, who's chief strategist of the 2008 Obama campaign and host of the Axe Files on CNN right now. Gentlemen, welcome uh, to both of you. Um, I think, do we have David Axelrod and also Rick Davis on the screen in front of us. Not quite at the moment, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, I'll carry on with the debate and hopefully we can get the right guests up. <laughs> okay, um, so let's start off by talking about this pandemic, which is still a global pandemic, is still uh, taking over the whole world. It is certainly in the grip of America as well, with millions of Americans infected, more than 210 thousand Americans have very sadly lost their lives to this disease as well. The president is infected with COVID-19 right now. So with that in mind, uh, David, I can see you on screen. So how is COVID-19 impacting on the electorate and how people are voting? Uh, I think it's been critical. Um, it's been critical because it is the issue that is consuming people here right now. We, we like, uh, like Europe, we're on a upswing right now and it's a it's a great concern. we've already lost uh, 215,000 people we, we have a quarter of the world's population we've lost uh, more than 20 percent of the victims to uh, COVID and the president's uh, performance on this has been uh, concerning from the beginning uh, and it has become more concerning now that we know what he knew at the time Bob Woodward wrote a book 
saying that the president told them in early February that this was a deadly virus, five times more deadly than the flu, uh, and, and easily communicable. And he told the American people at the very same time that it was no worse than a common cold, uh, a, a mild flu, not to worry. And, uh, and that held back our preparations for months and months and months. And then having closed the country down, he opened it up uh, too quickly. And, um, you know, so there's been this pattern of denial. Uh, and it's replayed itself, Hannah, in this microcosm of his own illness, uh, where he has minimized uh, his own illness and, and come back and told people not to worry. It's vanishing again. So it's, he's reminding people uh, of exactly how he mishandled the thing in the first place. And I think it's been a very, very damaging Thing. You know, people were willing to, to uh, excuse some of Donald Trump's uh, idiosyncrasies until when things were going well. Now the cost of them uh, to people in their lives has become very clear. And I think it's been uh, really damaging to him. And he is in a terribly deep hole uh, right now, as Bill described. Uh, really hard to see the path forward for him. Rick, your views on this, this, this tough guy image who's beaten COVID um, that Trump has presented to the world. Uh, do you think that's been uh, a good approach, a successful approach? Well, I, I think you can go back to that sort of pre two weeks ago when uh, Bill McIntyre mentioned between the New York Times taxes revelation, the disaster of faith of the president, and his own COVID uh, diagnosis. He'd actually kept the campaign relatively in striking distance. I mean, it had been kind of frozen in time for six months uh, leading up to uh, that moment in time. But look, it's undeniable that the American public, uh, I think, you know, over 55% think COVID is the number one issue. Now, it divides along party lines, right? I mean, Donald Trump talks to Republicans and Republicans only. And, you know, if you look at the issue set for Republicans, COVID comes behind the economy, it comes behind abortion, it comes behind crime. And so for his issue set, where it, with his group of voters, you know, it's just not the issue that's driving them to the polls. But when you look at then everybody else, independents and Democrats, it is the number one issue by far and away. And it has so many implications, COVID on the economy, COVID on health care. You know, we now see the ACA becoming a major issue. That relates to COVID. So to say that COVID is driving this election, I think maybe an understatement since now the president has become a victim of COVID. And this idea to sort of be the Mussolini of our time by saying nothing hurts me, uh, I am, you know, the Superman as he uh, recounted the people he wanted to be. Uh, is just ringing hollow, I believe, with voters who say this is something to be concerned about. It is something we have to sacrifice to manage. And I think the American public has done a phenomenal job of, of doing what their scientists and doctors have asked them to do to avoid a worse pandemic. Uh, and they don't quite understand or rationalize why their government uh, hasn't gotten the message. And so I, I think this is... This is, this is now the thing that people are going to talk about for the next three weeks. You've got 22 days till the end of the voting. You've already had over six and a half million people cast their ballot. And my guess is the majority of those people significantly were voting based on Trump's bad COVID uh, performance. And, uh, and so we'll see, we'll see where it goes from here. But it's, it's tied to all these other issues that you can't talk about this election in a vacuum. It's COVID number one and everything else secondary to that. And healthcare, talking about healthcare actually leads us nicely and then into talking about Supreme Court nomination as well. Um, Amy Coney Barrett in front of the Judicial, judicial Committee today. Um, I, I suppose we're at the point now where more and more people are going to be voting based on Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act now, how much it means to them, whether they're going to lose their insurance, their cover. Uh, if Trump is re-elected, if Republicans are elected up and down the ticket, and also if Amy Coney Barrett, Coney Barrett is confirmed as well. David? Well, uh, look, the pandemic has brought health care right uh, to the fore. There are millions of people who've lost their jobs and with it, uh, their health care. So uh, the, there was a Fox News poll last week 
that showed that 64% uh, of Americans said they wanted to keep the law in place. That's the highest number ever recorded. And I think it's this confluence of events. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I don't think Americans are so much focused on the Supreme Court, but Democrats, I think, resign to the fact that if Republicans want to confirm her, they will have very clearly in this hearing today, and I think for the next four days, they've been hammering her previous written opposition to the Affordable Care Act, uh, and they are using this hearing to hammer at an issue that, frankly, was the most important issue in 2018 when they took over uh, the House of Representatives, this issue of what happens to people with pre-existing medical conditions if the Affordable Care Act goes away. So um, I, I don't think this is a very good, you know, the, there is a, 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 Republicans are very focused on getting another seat on the Supreme Court that, that'll help with the conservative base. But in the larger sense, this, this uh, highlighting of this issue at this moment is kind of a disaster for Republican Senate candidates and I think also for the president. Rick, why is, why is that, that it would be a, a disaster for Republican candidates? Uh, Hannah, the field of play has changed. When we were helping John McCain get reelected to the United States Senate in 2016, ACA was on the ballot and, and John McCain ran actively against it. Uh, we were down to our one last insurer in Arizona uh, prices had gone up 58% to the consumer uh, to get basic health care. And, uh, and, and it was a good campaign issue for Republicans in 2016. No question Donald Trump made good use of it in forging a coalition, especially in the suburbs, for people who were afraid that they were going to lose the kind of independent uh, health care that they had. Uh, then, as, as David said, along came 2018. And the, the Democratic Party and their candidates did a phenomenal job of turning the debate on health care into preserving pre-existing conditions. Now, Republicans gave them all the help they could by trying to take away the uh, exemption for pre-existing conditions in the prior year. Uh, but it just shows you how significantly and quickly the issue had changed from in 2016, an issue that won a lot of Republican races by attacking the lack of functionality of ACA in general to uh, this pre-existing condition issue. And then when you look at surveys today, I mean, you know, a, a full, you know, 40% uh, of the public demands that their pre-existing conditions be preserved and exactly almost the same amount uh, want a better addressing of COVID. So, so when you look at this, you realize, wow, that, that this issue alone is topping the needs and concerns of voters along with a global pandemic. And so the Supreme Court debate, um, if the Democrats will have their way, and my guess is they'll have much more message discipline uh, than most people because they've been doing it now for quite some time, is will your pre-existing conditions exemption be taken away by the court who the Trump administration keeps saying is going to get rid of ACA? And so if, if, if Amy Comey Barrett becomes a, a placeholder for the debate on, on pre-existing conditions, that is a very bad thing for Republicans trying to get suburban women to vote for them uh, in this election. Hannah, one, one additional point for those who aren't aware. The Supreme Court's supposed to uh, convene on November 10th to hear the case that the Trump administration and some state Republican attorney generals are bringing to try and throw out the entire Affordable Care Act and with it the protections for people with pre-existing conditions. And so when you put that in the context of the speed at which they're racing to confirm this justice, to put her on the bench after she's expressed her view on this, it adds more combustibility to the issues. Yeah, I mean, on the timing of the confirmation vote, assuming that she, she, she is indeed confirmed, Donald Trump would obviously prefer it to happen before the election because it shores up his legacy. Uh, but am I right in thinking that, and Rick, perhaps this is a question for you, that GOP candidates up and down the country would prefer it to be something that motivates voters to get out there and that, it, that there is no confirmation until perhaps after November 3rd? Well, it, it, it is an incredibly polarized electorate, right? And so uh, when I said earlier that Donald Trump talks to Republicans and Republicans exclusively, 
that's because that's what he did in 2016 that won him the election. And he has not veered from that example one day since his presidency began. So in his construct, he is looking at this landscape and saying, I'm going to focus on you know, the economy, which is the one thing that he actually still pulls ahead of Joe Biden on, but only marginally now. Uh, but but he, wants to, he wants to get into these other issues. They want to talk about Amy Comey Barrett's you know, uh, position on abortion, because that's still a winning issue for him within his own party. They want to talk about uh, crime, because uh, the way they want to approach it, uh, law and order, it rings true uh, you know, for his base and gets them riled up. And so you know, he's going to go down the mat on these kinds of social issues and guns will come up in this debate because he believes that this is a core element of firing up his base. And so what you're gonna hear from the president, it will sound somewhat tone deaf to the public who are still being ravaged by COVID, but it, it's a message to his base that you know, we need to turn out more in order for me to, to, to be able to win. I mean, okay, I would say good. arguably the demographics don't really support him, <laughs> but, but I see no reason why he would change his campaign strategy at this moment. But a quick, a quick addenda and answer your question, Hannah. If this does not happen before the election and Joe Biden wins the election and wins by a substantial margin, as the polls suggest now, there's going to be a tremendous amount of pressure on the Senate to, to lay this thing uh, aside. And I don't think they'll do that, but I think they'd much rather tidy this up and get rid of it before election day than add that uh, added element of, uh, yeah. of pressure. There are plenty more to talk about um, as far as the Supreme Court is concerned. But in the meantime, I just want to um, interrupt the debate for a second because I want to put a, a, a poll question out to all of our uh, viewers, the people who are watching right now. I've got a couple of questions to ask you. And again, if you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen uh, to answer this. So the first question we have is, what is the number one issue on which you will cast your vote? One, economic recovery. Two, Supreme Court. Three, healthcare. Four, social justice. Or five, foreign policy. So do let us know. and We will return to the results of that poll. So please do take part and um, return to the results of the poll later on in, in the debate. And um, gentlemen, going back to the Supreme Court. Of course, any new justice, assuming it is Amy Coney Barrett, could end up being the decisive factor in, in, in adjudicating the outcome of this election if it's contested as well. How much will that have been a factor for, for Donald Trump, do you think, going into this? Well, you don't have to wonder about that because he's been vocal about it. He's said that he wants a ninth justice on the Supreme Court uh, in case election issues come there that have to be handled. That's his, one of his arguments for having the justice confirmed uh, by the end of, uh, before the election. And it, it dovetails with what has been his menacing of the election and uh, persistent suggestions that the election would be rigged and that there's going to be a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, legal combat around it afterwards. So, I don't think he's done her any favors by suggesting that he wants her on the bench to rule his way uh, on elections, which is his clear inference. I think it makes her job uh, harder, but I think that's clearly something that's on his mind. And Rick, to that point, I mean, we know a lot more about Amy Coney Barrett, Barrett now than we did just a couple of weeks ago, but you know, we didn't know that much about previous justices and they turned out to be a bit of a surprise to Donald Trump as well. Could, could she be a surprise? Sure. I mean, you get surprises on the Supreme Court all the time. Uh, presidents have had visions of putting their folks on the court uh, throughout the ages, and, and sometimes it works out great, and sometimes it doesn't work out at all. Uh, that lifetime appointment, the independence uh, to people who are incredibly smart and, and capable, uh, sometimes is uh, liberating to their past ideology. I think in this case, uh, uh, Amy Comey Barrett is not only a, I think, a really uh, talented uh, adjudicator, but, but she's an ideologue. I mean, I think that, that different from maybe other instances where there was a little less ideology involved, but more precedent, um, uh, justices have had more uh, independence. But but I think she truly believes the issues that she has commented on publicly. It would shock me 
uh, if, uh, if she did anything other than follow in her mentor, Justice Scalia's footsteps, uh, and, uh, and try and maintain his legacy as much as creating her own. So I think that's a, 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 a real function of her personality. Hannah, you know, there was some talk of another appellate court judge, Lagoa, down in Florida, who was a Cuban-American, and there was some thought that politically it might be better for the president to choose her because Florida is a pivotal state in this election. And the reason I was told he didn't choose her uh, was because uh, conservative conservatives in the legal community did not want another suitor, that is, another judge who might not be as conservative as they as they hoped, whereas they have utter confidence in Barrett to be down the line uh, on their issues. So um, I think she was chosen for that purpose. Moving on to another um, issue that uh, both candidates will be fighting out, it out over over the next 22 days. Donald Trump is obviously trailing in the polls at the moment, um, but he is going to need to look at one, perhaps like one big thing that he can like grab onto, and maybe it would have been the economy six months ago or a year ago, is it going to be law and order now that is it going to be the thing that he grabs hold of and says, I am the candidate for law and order in this country? When you look at the, uh, the racial division in the country, when you look at the peaceful protests and also the rioting as well that's taking place, that has really kind of motivated some voters. Yeah, maybe take a swing at this first. Um, Look, I mean, this, this, is an, this is an issue that's changing. Uh, over the summertime, uh, during some of the protests uh, that embarked upon all over the country in major cities and elsewhere, uh, you saw a, a, a majority of the country sort of backing the protests. You know, they wanted to see change. Uh, the majority of voters were looking at this through a fulcrum of trying to do what they can to improve race relations in the United States. I think there was a genuine goodwill associated with the need to galvanize action around these movements. Since then, um, I do think the president has actually been somewhat successful in framing these as uh, violent acts uh, uh, and, that, uh, and that, you know, his message of law and order uh, has probably resonated with some of these voters. I mean, you do it long enough and hard enough. Uh, we've seen the history of this issue over time in our country, uh, basically getting votes through fear. And, and it is a device, and it's a device that Donald Trump has been wielding pretty successfully. Uh, you've seen a decrease in the amount of public support over the last few months around the notion of these protests being a positive change for the country rather than a destabilizing uh, initiative in neighborhoods. So um, I don't doubt that Donald Trump will try and finish strong on this issue. Uh, I think there is a breaking point. It, 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 it isn't helping him recover the votes that he lost in 2018, white suburban women. Uh, they wanna see change in America for the better, and they've held out for that. Uh, but it may be a way to try, and as we've said you know, repeatedly in this conversation, double down on getting his base uh, out and trying to turn out more and more people who would agree with him, you know, on, on this, 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 uh, this, this crime issue that he's trying to turn a, a, a protest movement into a, in a, into a crime spree. Yeah, and David, like conversely, how is Joe Biden's argument on this? I mean, how is his appeal reaching voters in terms of, has he been too soft or is he being too hard on the rioting, the protests? I thought he could have been a, 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 a beat quicker in getting in on it. He, when he did get in, he said the right things. He, uh, he condemned the rioters and made it very clear that they should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. But I would say two things about this. One is, in that same uh, Fox News poll uh, this previous week, the people were asked, do you think Joe Biden talked the way he talks about racial inequality and the police is leading to an increase in acts of violence or not? Uh, they said no, 38-52, they said no. They asked the same thing about Donald Trump and the numbers were reversed. 58% said the way Donald Trump talks about racial inequality and the police is leading to an increase in acts of violence. And as Rick points out, this was very much aimed at the suburbs. His, his whole attack on this was to warn the suburbs that people were coming to maraud in their communities. Well, the gap in the suburbs is actually widening. It's not shrinking. So I don't think this was a winning strategy. The initial premise of your question was, 
will he be talking about this or the economy? Frankly, Donald Trump should have been talking about nothing about, uh, but who is best equipped to lead the economy out of the hole that it's in. Uh, he, that's the one area where he seems to have some advantage left over Joe Biden. And I think a lot of Republicans would have liked to see him use his debate and other opportunities to really hammer that issue. But instead, he's gone off in other directions, including this one. OK, we, um, I have another poll question for all of the, uh, the, the viewers as well. And I think I might just be getting some of the answers uh, from the previous poll. So let's do this one first. So we asked before, what is the issue that's most motivating you ahead of November 3rd? And the results are on the, the economy and jobs is 20 percent, Supreme Court, uh, 4%, percent, health care, 18 percent, social justice, 13 percent, foreign policy, 16 uh, percent uh, and other 29 percent. So, you know, it, as you, you're just saying, David, that Donald Trump should have been talking about the economy all along. That is still obviously the thing that, that and health care, both 20 percent and 18 percent, the thing that is actually motivating people the most. And of course, that's the biggest problem that any candidate has in this it, it, through a global pandemic is how do you split your your support between supporting the economy and saving lives. Yeah, well, he's talking ineffectively about the uh, pandemic and healthcare, and he's yeah. not talking at all about the economy, where he might have some toehold uh, to move forward here. So, you know, they've got strategic issues over there. In, in the <laughs> they've got they've got both personal issues and strategic issues. Um, I, I would say too. I mean, just like in the current events category. He's got an opportunity and has had one for weeks to cut a deal with Nancy Pelosi in the House and, and put a stimulus out there that would get the message back on the economy uh, and, and in a way that um, would be incredibly positive. I mean, not very many presidents have been able to sign a bill giving trillions of dollars to the American economy at a time of such need, supported by Congress, supported by the Federal Reserve Board, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a win waiting to happen. And for whatever reason, I, I, I cannot fathom the strategy behind the current administration's moves um, is uh, it looks like this may die a death between now and election day. And, and if it does, uh, and the economy uh, continues to sort of sputter along, uh, there'll be no one to blame uh, for the loss other than Donald Trump, because this is the one issue that he could hang his hat on, and for whatever reason, you know, he's he's just left it to die. Yeah, David, I think I heard you say, um, or maybe you were quoting someone else as well, that this is basically a referendum on Donald Trump, and it's you know, it's Trump v. Trump, and Trump is 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 losing right now. Um, with that in mind, let's bring up the second polling question for our viewers as well. And what is an issue that you wish was more prominent during the campaign? Uh, is it climate change? Is it leadership and character? Uh, or perhaps international cooperation, threat of military conflict, or international trade and commerce. Please do uh, send in your thoughts on that. We'd really appreciate it. And we'll, we'll be able to put some uh, further thoughts and questions to our guests uh, as we go through this webinar. Speaking about uh, the second point on that list, leadership and character, um, how important is that for Americans voting in this election, that they can pick a candidate who they want to be in the Oval Office, who they want to sort of stand on the world stage for their country and represent them. And do they think that Donald Trump has so far been successful in that? Certainly in terms of foreign policy, I, I assume that he would claim that there have been many, many wins in terms of America's standing and, and foreign, foreign policy. David, perhaps to you first. You know, I don't think this is a foreign policy election. I think Americans are looking very much inward right now because of the pandemic, because of the economy. Um, and, you know, I think that issue of how America is looked upon by the world is very much seen through uh, a, a partisan lens. But I don't think it's the issues on which people are deciding. What I do think is important is that uh, Americans want to believe that their president has decency, that their president has empathy, uh, that their president cares about people like them. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why Biden is in a good position right now, because he, uh, he projects those qualities. Whatever you think his deficits may be, Joe Biden is seen, broadly seen as a decent, caring person. 
who's gone through struggles himself and understands the struggles of others. And in the midst of a monster pandemic, that is an extraordinarily important quality. And I think that supersedes you know, world leadership. I mean, I have my own feelings about the absence of American leadership in the world over the past four years uh, and how dramatically bad that's been. Uh, but, and I'm sure your audience uh, at the McCain Institute has a very keen sense of that. But uh, for the average American, I think it's much closer to home. And, and Rick, I mean, Donald Trump in 2016, he, he arguably connected with so many voters, especially white working class voters, because it, he made them feel good about themselves in a way that Hillary Clinton didn't, uh, with her comments about bas basket of deplorables and things like that. Has he now made himself so deplorable himself that he can't win over those voters again? Yeah, Hannah, I mean, you, you're exactly right. In 2016, I think most people would have recognized Donald Trump as the guy from Apprentice, right? A leader, someone who can make tough choices. I mean, it's a TV version of the man himself. But today, I go back to uh, where Bill McInturf kicked it off. Um, this was a pretty stable election with, with Joe Biden a little bit ahead for the longest time. But, but three things happened in the last two weeks that actually go right to his leadership and his character cheating on your taxes, uh, a bully uh, shows up at the debate pretending to be a president, and his immense lack of empathy around COVID was brought home by how he handled it when he got it himself. And I think those contrasts with what David was just saying are the strengths of Joe Biden. I mean, nobody would ever think Joe Biden would cheat on his taxes, be a bully, or be non-empathetic to people who have health conditions. Uh, uh, and, and that broke this campaign wide open. I mean, those, the last two weeks uh, uh, really changed the dynamic of this election around leadership and character. Now, we've had lots of black swan moments this year, and I wouldn't doubt that we'll have some more in the next three weeks. But if the election were today, we'd be talking about how his character and his leadership define the outcome. David, your final thoughts on that? And then I'm gonna ask you both to predict the outcome, so prepare yourselves. <laughs> No, I, 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 I quite agree. At the end of the day, this is a race about Donald Trump. He insists that it'll be a race about Donald Trump. And he's come up wanting in some fundamental qualities of character and leadership that people feel are essential to the presidency of the United States. to a conclusion on the end of the, uh, the debate part, at least, and I have to thank you both. Moderators haven't had a very easy time of things in recent weeks, and you've been very well behaved, so I appreciate it. Um, just to bring you some the, the results of that last poll on issues that you wish were more uh, visible, I suppose, through, through this election campaign. Uh, climate change has got 19%, leadership and character, which we've just been talking about, 44%, so quite significant there. International cooperation, 25%, abortion, just 1%, uh, gun control, 1%, and international trade and commerce, uh, 11%. So certainly it seems that leadership and character are uh, very uh, big issues, or is a big issue for those watching today. Gentlemen, thank you. Do stay on the, on the webinar, on the call, because uh, we will be putting some questions to you from, from lots of people tuned in uh, in the next uh, couple of minutes or so. But in the meantime, everyone, I would like to uh, introduce now Trevor Potter uh, on the, uh, the, the state of voting. Uh, Trevor was general counsel to John McCain's 2000 and 2008 presidential campaigns. He is a former chairman of the Federal Election Commission and founder and president of the Campaign Legal Center. Trevor, um, very few believe that whoever wins on November 3rd or indeed in the weeks afterwards, once all the mail-in ballots have been counted, uh, that this is going to go uh, uncontested. So how is America's democratic infrastructure set up? And how can it fare if there is such a contest in the weeks leading up to, or the months leading up to a January inauguration? Thank you, Hannah. It's uh, great to be with you all at uh, the Straight Talk Express and uh, the McCain Institute. Uh, I think it's important to understand that our election system is unlike most democracies and that we do not have a central government election agency that is running this. We're a federal system and our constitution says that each of the states runs elections both for their state offices and for federal offices, their representatives in Congress and the presidency. Congress can override 
uh, those provisions if it chooses, and it has uh, in uh, ways like passing the Civil Rights Act in the 1960s that said there certain conduct that states cannot engage in, they cannot discriminate against minority voters. But in general, states run those elections. And going into this year, we had a real uh, tapestry of ways in which Americans voted. Uh, at one end, we had five states that voted entirely by mail, which is to say people were registered to vote and the state sent them their ballots in the mail, people filled them out and they either put them back in the mail or they could drop them off at government offices or in drop boxes. And that's a lot of the, they're all in the West, uh, Washington, Oregon, Utah, Colorado, uh, Hawaii, and a mix. Uh, Utah's a very Republican state, but they did 100% mail-in voting. The other end of the spectrum, you had some of the more traditional uh, Eastern states, uh, thinking particularly of, say, Pennsylvania, New York, with very few mail-in ballots, what they called absentee ballots, meaning uh, you weren't able to vote and therefore in person so that you could get a ballot in advance and go ahead and mail it in. So those states have not had much experience with mail voting. Uh, in between, you, you had a mix. There were big states like California, Arizona, Florida, with a lot of mail-in voting. Uh, Arizona has what they call a permanent absentee list so that you could sign up once and then you automatically got your ballots. So enter this year and there are two things that have run into each other. On the one side is the virus, COVID. And we had primary elections this spring at a time when the virus was roaring through the country and governors were ordering people to stay at home. So what to do? Uh, first, th there were states that said you really can't go out, and then people didn't want to be in in-person crowded polling places where they had a risk of infection. Plus, the election officials, who were traditionally older, often retired Americans doing this as civic duty and being paid very little, they didn't want to be in those places exposed to all those people, so they had a staffing problem. The result was waves of absentee ballots, mail-in ballots, people voting safely at home, and changes in state laws. So that states that in the past had required that you vote in person unless you were out of the state on election day or deathly ill, suddenly said anyone can vote in person. So we have seen a wave of voting from at home uh, in advance of the election by mail, or at least on paper and then dropping it off. The conflicting uh, tension here has been from President Trump, who has led a, I would say, unremitting campaign attacking what he calls mail-in balloting, which means voting by the mail. He's tried to differentiate between that and absentee, which is hard to do, they're really the same. So as we look to the election day, what we're facing is the possibility that if this is really close and there are a few key states like Pennsylvania with lots of ballots coming in in the mail, Trump will try to cut that off and say, you have to stop with election day. Okay, Trevor, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna go to questions uh, from uh, the audience, people who are watching, thank you so much for sending all your questions in. Um, and I want to make sure we have as much time as possible to get to all of the panelists. And um, Trevor, actually, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, this is a question from uh, Caroline Horhey, uh, who says, on what legal basis does the GOP have in curbing mail-in voting? Well, the president claims that it leads to the possibility of, he would say, the reality of, of huge fraud. In fact, there has been almost no demonstrated fraud in all those states that do mail-in voting. So what they have tried to do is to make it hard for states to move to mail-in voting. They've said the legislature has to approve it, the governor can't do it on their own, the state officials can't do it, or it was done too late. So they have gone to court. There are 350 lawsuits going on in this country right now over ways in which we vote. Uh, do you need a signature 
uh, on your outside ballot? Do you need a witness? And every time the states have tried to make it easier, the Republican Party and Trump have gone to court to prevent that. So that's their first way. Their second, I think, will be a potential post-election attack, which says, because we think these mail-in ballots are subject to fraud, they shouldn't be counted. And they will try, I think the potential here is they will try to stop the counting process after election day saying the votes that were cast through election day and counted in person are the ones that should count and the ones that are being counted afterwards shouldn't. And many states don't even start counting ballots until election day so that it will take some days in these big states with uh, lots of ballots like Pennsylvania that aren't used to it to count. Okay, question now for, uh, for you, Rick. This is from Dirk Eller, Operating Partner for TPG Capital, who says, uh, on the Supreme Court question, how should we interpret Biden and Harris's non-response in both debates, presidential and vice presidential, to the question around whether they plan to increase the size of the court if elected? Yeah, and look, I think this is a sort of Republican way of getting the uh, debate changed and shifted uh, to uh, something that the left wing of the Democratic Party has been pushing, right? And uh, Donald Trump tried very unsuccessfully to paint uh, uh, Joe Biden, both in his convention and in the debate, as this captive of the left wing that is outside the normal, you know, sort of steps of the American public. And, and their new uh, issue related to that is packing the court. I dare say there's probably very few voters who even know what packing the court means, but they it, it definitely res resonates as a negative. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, 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 Mr. McInturf can tell us what the real polling is on, uh, on, on this. But, but look, I think it actually uh, uh, did a good job of changing the topic a little bit after the debate with the vice president's uh, nominees. Um, uh, clearly, Kamala Harris didn't want to answer the question, uh, and the campaign didn't follow up with any kind of declarative statement, which I thought would have been a no-brainer. Uh, just say that, um, you know, uh, we have no intention of packing the court. We don't believe in packing the court. And, and the Republicans have been packing the court for three years. I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't say that, but for whatever reason, I think that uh, this has been uh, part of the Republican effort that have worked. I, I don't think it's changing a lot of votes, but it's definitely distracting the media and, and caused the, the Biden campaign to be on defense a little bit. And, and Bill, to that point, Rick asking there uh, about packing the bench and what that means and what impact that's having on voting trends. I mean, is there any data on that? Yeah, there's a, we currently have nine U.S. Supreme Court justices. They've been that way for 150 years. Um, and just for a little history, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, you know, try to increase the number of judges. That's what we mean by the term packing. The data is pretty clear. People in the country did not do not believe that we should stick with nine justices. They don't want to have any more than that. Uh, but uh, it's a pretty, but it's, it's not it's not an easy to explain campaign issue. I think it has some legs. I think again, if you were the Trump campaign and you had this deck of cards, you would say, "Hey, I've got three weeks left. What am I going to talk about?" And as uh, David said, what I think you would talk about is, "Look, our economy's uh, in trouble. So who can improve the economy? I did. Mean mean Donald Trump or Joe Biden? And uh, hey, look, the guy wants to stop fracking. He wants to do the Green New Deal." He's going to be a captive of the left. And, and talk about breaking norms, he's going to try to, he won't even answer the question. He wants to put in a lot more judges and change the way we played the game for 150 years. That's a coherent rationale for why you shouldn't vote for Joe Biden. And it would be helpful, I think, in clarifying if the uh, president and the campaign could spend three weeks in a row saying those things. So there's a, a clear rationale to uh, the difference in this election that uh, would be motivating to his own potential voters. Interesting, interesting. Okay, I have another question. This one to, uh, to David. Uh, this comes from uh, Vin Wynn, who's a McCain alumni member. Um, uh, it's quite uh, relatively long, but I'll try and uh, summarize as, like, as, I, as best I can. We are a family of immigrants who came to the US after the Vietnam War. I recently confronted family members who were falsely claiming that Biden and the Democrats voted against aid to Vietnamese refugees. To the contrary, Democrats passed measures but actually welcomed Vietnamese refugees. How do we effectively combat 
widespread misinformation in an era where there's so much uh, mistrust of media and when so many Americans are getting their news from social media. The onset of fake news. Yeah, no, I, look, I, that's a, I can't believe they get the court packing question and I have to deal with this possible <laughs> issue. Um, let me just go back for a second and say on that, I, I, don't, I, don't think, I think that the Biden campaign could handle that better uh, than they have to put it to rest. But on, the, um, uh, on this issue, this is a huge problem and it's not just a problem for Joe Biden, it's a problem for democracy and not just democracy in America, but democracy in, in Britain and democracy everywhere. And the more that we are stuck in our information silos and getting information the way we do uh, increasingly, uh, the more these things can fester. And you know, campaigns have to be alert to what's going on on social media and should be very, very firm in, 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 in pushing back on social media uh, memes wherever they uh, wherever they find them. We had a whole unit way back in 2012 uh, that was really monitoring social media with a mind toward pushing back. But this has only gotten monstrously more difficult. Uh, and it is a problem. And, you know, Hillary Clinton experienced it in 2016. And it opens the door to malign actors, not just in our own politics, but Russia and others who, who know how to play this game. It is a concern. I will say this, uh, and I think Bill can confirm this. If these polls don't move, if these polls remain the way they are, all of this stuff that we're talking about uh, becomes less relevant. It's, 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 you know, if, for example, on election night, uh, Trevor, uh, if, uh, example, on election night, uh, Florida should come in and they count their ballots on election day, not they don't have, they don't extend past election day. Uh, if Joe Biden wins Florida, you can be pretty sure that Joe Biden's gonna win the election because no president has won, no Republican has won the presidency since Calvin Coolidge in 1924 uh, without uh, Florida. Ohio, Ohio counts them on the same day. If, if Biden wins Ohio, uh, no Republican president has ever been elected without uh, Ohio. So these things are all challenges but the margin will make a difference in terms of how impactful they are in this election. Yeah. Uh, speaking about polls then, Bill, a uh, question to you. Um, this is a question coming from Fran Townsend. Fran asks, um, Biden is ahead in the polls, but how reliable are they? Um, I suppose that's in, in reference to what happened four years ago. Uh, and another part of the question is um, how far ahead is Biden in swing states where it really matters, which is, which is a lot of what David was just talking about. Uh, first, um, quick note about the national polls in 2016. The average uh, telephone poll by NBC, Wall Street Journal, ABC, Pew, the major pollsters was Clinton winning by 3.5 points nationally. She won by 2.2. So nationally, were the polls wrong? Yeah, your point, it's a point and a half. But look, everyone has the right to be concerned. We're going to have 150 million plus voters. We're going to have perhaps the highest turnout as a percent of the electorate we've had since 1960. There are hundreds of thousands of white Don scale voters across these industrial states that could come out to vote. The RNC is spending $60 million in the last few weeks trying to increase that vote. They're very hard to measure in polling. Um, so there is no pollster who's going to say, oh, yeah, we got this totally nailed. Um, However, uh, David makes the right point. Look, at some margin, real quickly, Trump lost California by 4 million votes. He, won, he lost by 3 million, meaning he won 49 other states by a million. If the vote, if Trump's losing nationally by three to five points, you, can, you could try to win these states. If you're losing by seven to 10 points, those states uh, are just, they don't operate like that. Um, so, um, Right now, Trump is losing the swing states by an average of about hmm, four, four and a half points, four or five points. He's losing the nationally by 10 and a half. That means he's running about five points better. So basically what you have to do is you've got to get the national margin down to about five points. And as you move the national five points, you move the swing states so they are true toss-ups. Um, and um, this today, you know, it's a reminder we had the Access Hollywood tape. 
and Trump was down by double digits uh, around October 11th, four years ago. The electorate snapped back into something more normal. We have three weeks left. And is that a possibility of what could happen in terms of a snapback to something that looks like um, uh, that looks like where we were two plus weeks ago? Absolutely, that's a possibility. And so, um, so I, I would just again, I, but I would last point real quick. I would tell people if you want to know what's going to happen, look at the real clear politics average of presidential approval on election day. If it's forty-seven, the race is close. Forty-five, maybe. If it's forty-two or three. I don't see how the president wins that day. Question from a, a London viewer, and I'd ask the gentleman that you all unmute yourselves and, and whoever wants to answer this can, can dive in. But it says, sadly, we don't have an ideal candidate. Uh, do you think there will be low voter turnout as a result? And do you think there is a silent vote for Trump? There's just been talk of, of being very high ter turnout, but this uh, viewer, wanting to know whether actually, because of the Trump effect, there could be really low turnout. And perhaps, I guess, because of coronavirus as well. Let, let, let's let Bill McIntyre answer this, because their measure of voter interest is really, really uh, telling. Sure, Bill, go for it. Yeah, no, sorry, this is absolutely, uh, you know, where's the polling gonna be right about? We had the highest interest we've ever had in September of an election year since I wrote the question in the mid-1990s. We've had 6 million people already vote. We have over 75 million people who've already asked for an absentee ballot. The turnout's gonna be massive because by the way, the gentleman's from a different country. In this country still, if you're angry, ticked off and saying the country's in the wrong direction, your instinct is I gotta go vote and clean this up. That's a good impulse uh, for the electorate. And so we're gonna see, I think north of 150 million votes up from 134. So uh, here's like, you know, I don't know who's going to win, but let me tell you this: I can I will. You, I will be beyond shocked if we do not have a record number of people voting. And and everything we're watching in terms of the early vote tells us and reinforces this is going to be a massive record-breaking turnout. Question: I think this one would go for to uh, to Rick. If Trump's defeat is clear, but he refuses to accept it, will the Republican establishment, so donors, leadership, etc. Let him know he has to concede. Sure. I mean, I think that there uh, is a likely scenario that uh, the Republican establishment, whether it's leadership in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, or House leadership that's been a little more tolerant of, of Donald Trump, would get together and say something's got to happen. My, my guess is that um, uh, uh, not much of that's going to have an impact on Donald Trump. I mean, he's very much resistant to lobbying uh, by most people. He'll act in his own self-interest. That's the one thing you can probably guarantee. I would say that based on the conversation we had today, uh, it's, it's, it's highly likely that there is more clarity to this election than Donald Trump wants the public to believe, right? We don't have to actually fall for his narrative. I mean, he kept saying on the election night in, uh, in 2018 in the Florida elections, stop counting the votes. This is right where we want it. <laughs> you know, only count what came in today. We don't need any absentees to determine it. As, as Trevor said earlier, no doubt that will be his, his opinion. But if you look at what um, uh, David said earlier, you know, and you start combining states like, you know, Michigan and Ohio and Florida and North Carolina and Arizona, and you start having victories of any margin, uh, by Democrats in those states. These are states that historically you cannot lose if you want to be a Republican president. And so I really think that it's going to be incumbent upon the outcome. When you look at this election, it's also going to be undeniable that everybody who could could get to a polling place or stick a stamp on an envelope got to vote this year. Um, as Bill turned out uh, or pointed out, uh, you know, his models show historic turnout, but like in 2018, we had a historic turnout. This has been bubbling up for quite some time. We had more people turn out in the midterm election than it turned out since Teddy Roosevelt. And so uh, this is a trend in American politics that's the healthiest part of what you've seen so far in the last couple of years. And so I do think that we stand the chance of actually having something that looks like a victory for democracy at the end of all this, and not otherwise. 
And I just wanted to check, is, is Mark still on the, on the line? If he is, I have a question for him directly, but I'm not sure that he is. I can't see him on my screen at the moment. In which case, um, we will move on to, a, to, to another question. And um, this is again, another one from Fran Towns Townsend. He says, historically, how much do polls move in the last three weeks? And we're of course, 22 days out now. Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> um, well, the, um, uh, probably Trump in 2016 is probably the best example of what can happen. Uh, again, the, after the Access Hollywood story, uh, uh, he was down double digits. He was down, uh, as I said, three and a half points the last weekend and found a way to win. Um, polls are a lot more volatile when you have a non-incumbent. Uh, the incumbent uh, job approval kind of defines the vote. I don't, uh, I don't, so in other words, Donald Trump has operated from 43 to 46% approval for almost his entire presidency. Uh, I was, as a Republican, I was hoping that he might move to 47 or 48. I think this confluence of events gonna cap him about where he is and that's a good day. So, um, uh, so when the president's job approval is around 45 or 46% of the vote, that's what he's gonna get. Um, and, uh, but it needs to be remembered, he won the presidency at 46%. That's what John McCain got and he got, well, he lost by seven points and uh, Mitt uh, Romney got 47 and a half uh, points. He got more percent of the vote than, uh, than Trump and lost. So um, believe yeah. me, it's really quite hard quite to quite try quite to win a presidency in 46% of the vote. But, but in, he fair, did it. in fairness, he, he also had the advantage of two third party candidates on the ballot who siphoned a lot of votes off and lowered the threshold that he needed to win. He doesn't have that advantage this time. He has to come close to the upper 40s or 50 in these states to win. And uh, as you point out, Bill, if you're tethered to a job approval rating in the low to mid 40s, it's very tough to get that extra five yards, you know. Um, Ambassador Mark Green, we do have you back. Delighted to see you, sir. Um, I have a question yes. for you, and this is coming from David Young. And the question is, how does America come back? We are more separate, siloed than ever, being reinforced by social media. In my view, the McCain Institute has a unique opportunity to take a lead in the slow process to be to um, be curious about um, diversity rather than disregard it. Uh, so there's a lot in built into that question. So first off, uh, let's remember the genius of democracy. Democracy gives us the opportunity to reshape ourselves, to learn, to apply lessons, and to move forward. There's accountability. That's a good thing. At the McCain Institute, uh, that's really the voice that we try to project. We try to talk about the importance of character-driven leadership. We try to talk about the importance of leadership that brings people together inside the US, uh, both sides of the Atlantic, the importance of alliances. We'll move forward from these elections. Uh, there will be a, a, a period probably of a little bit of uncertainty in the days right after the election. But I have every confidence the American people will come together. Our leaders will come together. There are lots of challenges that are out there. And I think as we move forward, uh, it will, in many ways, refresh the strength of our system. I think that's a pretty good place to, uh, to, to, to leave things uh, for today then. Gentlemen, thank you all very, very much indeed for your, your thoughts, your expertise, your candor as well, um, and indulging in the, the, uh, the spirit of democratic uh, debate politics, of course, is supposed to be engaging and and fun and encouraging engagement as well from others. And I very much um, am sure you join me, gentlemen, in thanking the whole of the McCain Institute for providing this platform uh, to to have this discussion today, so close to this crucial election. Uh, to our viewers who have been tuned in over the, this uh, last hour, I'd like to ask you uh, another polling question. It's actually the first one we asked you. The reason I'm going to ask it now is because the results of which will be coming up in part two of this uh, debate series, which is going to be after November 3rd, actually on November 12th as well. So if I can ask you again, uh, and I'd be very grateful if you wouldn't mind just voting again now. The question is, of course, what is the number one issue on which you will cast your vote? Perhaps what you've heard today has, has slightly altered your perspective. Um, is it economic recovery? Is it the Supreme Court? Perhaps it's healthcare or social justice or foreign policy. Um, I understand that the results of this poll will be emailed out to all participants.
participants, but also, as I said, um, you will get the results of it in the part two of this debate series of Straight Talk Live. Part two uh, itself, as I said, is coming up <laughs> November the 12th, uh, and Alex Wagner has all of the details on that for you. Bye-bye. Hi everyone, I'm Alex Wagner. On November 12th, I'll be hosting part two of Straight Talk Live, a series of conversations about the 2020 US presidential election. I'll be joined by some of today's leading political experts just days after the November 3rd election. Will we know by then who will be the next president of the United States? Will the election be smooth or will it be more chaos in a monumentally chaotic year? And what will the outcome be for the global economy, healthcare, democracy, and US leadership abroad? Join us on November 12th to explore the latest news and analysis from the wildest American election in recent memory. That's November 12th for part two of Straight Talk Live. A spirit capable of compassion and sacrifice and endurance cannot be paralyzed by fear. We cannot give up on ourselves and on each other. We stand for truth against falsehood, freedom against tyranny, right against injustice, hope against despair. I believe we must always stand up for it, for if we do not, who will?